That's the most abundant stuff in the universe is dark energy. Uh, it's new. So I remember when the discovery of dark energy was announced and I thought that I was like, oh, these people are full of crap. Doesn't everybody know that there's no such thing as uh, the cosmological constant? I'm Dr. Jason Steffen. I'm a physics professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, most of my research is in exoplanets, but I've also done um, work on uh, dark matter, dark energy, uh, experimental searches for dark matter and dark energy. Uh, when, and that was especially when I was a postdoc at Fermilab, which is the American counterpart to the Large Hadron Collider, or at least the, the American counterpart to CERN. Is exactly, a better way exactly to right. And that's a really nice... Uh, lead into to the first thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about today, which is, uh, call it Daisy or Desi. How are they, how are they pronouncing it? Um, I learned it as Daisy. So let's call it Daisy for now. So, um, so Daisy, <laughs> which is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. Um, right. And this is a, a super telescope in Arizona that's going to apparently, according to BBC News, undertake the most detailed observation of the universe ever. So it's a collaboration of reach, uh, researchers from 25 institutions from the US, UK, France, Switzerland, and Spain. And it has a five year aim to shed light on dark energy, this mysterious force that leads to uh, the expansion of the universe. So why Arizona? Okay, I, I, and I know the answer to this question. Good. Um, so the reason is that way back in the day, there were two telescopes that were built at the same time. They're basically sister telescopes. One of them is the, the Blanco telescope um, in Chile, uh, Sierra Tololo, I think it's on Sierra Tololo. Uh, and then the uh, companion telescope that was built at the same time, essentially identical footprints and infrastructure and everything is the Mayal telescope in Arizona. Uh, they are not exactly identical, but they are um, mostly identical, like, I don't know, 99% identical. There are a few differences in some of the superstructure, I think. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was done at the Apache Point Observatory in uh, New Mexico. And that did this big survey of the whole sky. And from that survey, and it was both an imaging survey and a spectroscopic survey. So they would image and then they would um, take spectra of the different galaxies that they located and then use those spectra to map out mm. the galaxy redshift catalog. Yeah. Yeah. Astronomers often use the term redshift to describe how far away objects really are. To understand what cosmic redshift is, we must think about sound. A great example of this is a police car. You hear its siren because the waves travel through the air into your ear. If the police car is moving, then the sounds in front of it are compressed and create a higher frequency sound. And the sound waves behind it are stretched out, creating a lower frequency sound. As the police car passes in front of you, you would hear the familiar Doppler shift. Light is quite similar. It also travels in waves, and it's quite a similar process to what is happening within the waves. Light waves are able to be compressed and stretched, just like sound. But with sound, you would change the frequency. But with light, you change the color. Blue light has shorter wavelengths than red. When an object in space moves towards us, the light waves are compressed into higher frequencies. And this is why the light is blue shifted. It's shifted towards the shorter wavelengths. But when an object moves away from us, the light waves are now stretched. These waves now go into the lower frequencies. And this is what's known when light goes to red shifted. It shifts to the longer wavelengths. So how do we calculate distance by using redshift? Well, the light from the most distant objects in our universe is redshifted, very redshifted, as seen from Earth. And this is basically because the universe is expanding. That the further away a galaxy is, the faster it is moving. And the faster a galaxy moves, the more its light is redshifted. 
So by measuring the amount of redshift is a great way to measure the distance of the galaxy relative to Earth. By using cosmic redshift, astronomers are able to measure the distance of galaxies as far as 12 billion light years away. With the latest technology that we have in space telescopes and ground-based telescopes, we are pushing this cosmic redshift limit even further back, looking into the deep parts of the universe and telling us really how the universe was created and how it evolved. Um, and so there's some really famous images from Sloan Digital Sky Survey, including like quasars and things like that. So it had on the same instrument or on the same telescope, it had both an imaging survey and a spectroscopic survey. And when they do a spectroscopic survey, you have to have a fiber optic on each of the targets. So what they had, I don't have it in my office anymore because we're making a display piece out of it, but they had these big plates that were like manhole cover size plates with 640 holes in it, plus the mounting bracket holes. But those 640 holes would be to where you would plug in 640 different fiber optic cables. And so they had students in there plugging in the fiber optic cables into the different um, plug plates. And then they would test them to make sure that they were put in properly. And then they would mount it on the telescope and take the spectra of the galaxies that they had identified in the imaging survey, which they had taken um, well, before. And I think it was... I don't know what the lag was between when they took the images and identified the galaxies and then when, went back and um, then did the spectroscopy on all of those galaxies. So um, the progeny, there was a great uh, talk that was given by someone at Ohio State. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he his talk was the progeny or like the, I think it was the progeny of Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and he talked about all the other things that came from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, because um, it was gigantic. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was a million galaxy redshifts was wow. the goal. They ended up getting two million spectra, one million galaxies, and basically one million stars. And that was orders of magnitude larger than any previous survey hmm. in terms of doing that. So then uh, the next step, I guess, in that chain was to do a large imaging survey that had a more ambitious camera um, and a larger telescope. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey telescope is like two and a half meters or something like that. The Blanco telescope and the Mayal telescope are four meter telescopes. And so when you get that extra factor of two means you have almost 10 times the uh, light gathering power. So, um, so you can look further out, you can look further back in time with, with those larger telescopes. Right. And you can see, yeah, so you can see fainter objects. Um, and so the dark energy survey was developed in the late 2000s from, it had already been quite a ways underway when I got to Fermilab. They built the camera at Fermilab. So it's like a $30 million um, 500 megapixel camera. It was a gigantic camera. Um, it weighed as much as a car uh, and had this big CCD footprint. So the dark energy survey was an imaging survey that would you do photometric redshifts, which is you look for the changing color of the galaxies uh, as as you go back in distance because so galaxies have a similar spectrum or most of their spectra are kind of similar to each other. In particular, there's some features, that, um, I, I think they call it the red edge, that when you look in multiple different pass bands, uh, the farther away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from you, and it shifts the relative colors or the relative brightness in these different colors. So they do. So those are called photometric redshifts. And Dark Energy Survey was doing <coughs> photometric redshifts on this gigantic chunk of the sky. And along with that, so it was around the time that they were finishing the development of the Dark Energy camera that people and. Of course, I'm biased, but my understanding was that a lot of this um, development or a lot of the plans for doing the spectroscopic survey were at Fermilab. And a lot of the people who had been working on the dark energy camera had then shifted over to, OK, we want to do a spectroscopic survey because you need to get higher precision redshifts in order to do you know, whatever the science they wanted to do. Uh, there was a big debate about what telescope to put it on. And most people were saying that they should put it, well, most people at the time were saying that they should put it on the Blanco telescope. They should, because the Blanco telescope is this four meter telescope that's in Chile and it already had the camera on it. And so it had already done the imaging survey. 
So they already knew where, or the, in principle, they would have known where the targets were to, to follow up with the spectrograph. Um, but then it came into, so then the discussion was, okay, if we don't do it on the Blanco, then the Mayal is the next obvious one because it's the same size. And so we'll have the same photometric properties. Um, it'll be in the Northern hemisphere. So we'll have to do, you know, there's extra work that will have to be done getting a good map of the sky to find the targets. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about the national laboratory politics, meaning that since Fermilab had such a major role in uh, the development of dark energy survey, then it would, then DAISY would be given basically to a different national lab to lead um, in order to kind of spread the wealth yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's always some international lab pride that gets involved in these kinds of things where everyone at Fermilab was, well, everyone that I talked to, which is like, you know, two people or something like that, we, we were all saying, oh, well, clearly Fermilab should lead it and we're going to get screwed because they're going to give it to Berkeley or whatever to, um, so when I say Berkeley, I mean Berkeley Lab, not um, not Berkeley, the university, to develop this instrument. But, you know, that was all stuff that was going to shake out anyways, and that was those were all decisions that would be made way above the heads of any of the scientists that were on it. Yeah. Because the first priority of a national laboratory director is to make sure that the laboratory has a budget. Yeah. And that usually... Um, comes in the form of having the right kinds of projects that, you know, match the personnel uh, numbers that you have. True. So, so that's kind of the backstory. Is there, is there anything in the, the weather in Arizona with it being very dry? Because what I remember being in Cambridge, my director of studies was um, uh, a radio astronomer and he used to jet off to Tenerife and California and Hawaii and all these beautiful places with very dry climates. Apparently, this was extremely important for the radio astronomy. Is there anything in the weather in Arizona, or is that is that a complete um, red hair? Yeah, so the weather in Arizona is is quite good for observing. Um, the there are a number of telescopes that are already there, so the Kitt Peak National Observatory is there, and so this telescope this is a pre existing telescope that was um, they didn't have to build anything to go there, so so that's why it's built there. Okay. Um, and it's the proximity to the University of Arizona is good, um, and, and all the logistical things that are it's needed. it's pretty high. It's not gigantically high. Um, the mountains in Arizona aren't all that tall, um, but the air is dry, so that helps as well. Cool. Uh, now I will point out that the Sonoran Desert, where Arizona is located, gets more rain than the Mojave Desert, where Las Vegas. <laughs> <is>. <clears throat> So they have a different weather pattern. Their weather pattern is fueled from the Gulf of Mexico. So they, sh uh, they should have brought it over to you instead. Yeah, they should have. Well, we don't have the infrastructure built. But <laughs> if we had the infrastructure built, then, you know, then we would make even more cooler discoveries. So stepping stepping back um, a little further on this, they're looking at dark energy. What What's the deal with this? Our understanding, like the composition of the universe is essentially 5% regular matter, uh, twenty five percent dark matter and seventy percent dark energy. So that's the and, that's and, not exactly dark, right, but it's, dark is this word that we physicists put on the front of things when we have no idea what the hell it is. But it makes it yeah, sound cool. The, the, it, it does make it sound cool. I think the original motivation was because it doesn't interact with photons. Yes, and therefore yes, it was and, actually so dark, they're not yeah. bright. Uh, and that's. Dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter was discovered first. That was discovered in the 1930s by Fritz Zwicky. Um, and so dark matter, the reason we know it's there is from the, the gravitational studies of the rotations of galaxies, which it suggests that there's an amount of matter there, but there's less light than we would expect from, right. from, the, from the gravitational rotation. Right. So there are two main... Um, two main observations that motivate dark matter, at least initially. One of them was the fact that galaxy clusters were able to stay together because the galaxies within the cluster would otherwise be moving too fast to be contained by the stars that were located in the cluster. Now, some of the missing matter is hot gas, uh, but not all of it. So that suggested there was another component of mass that was that was binding those galaxies together that we couldn't see, that wasn't right. emitting light, yeah. And then a similar effect happens with um, 
galaxies themselves, individual galaxies, where the stars within the galaxies are orbiting the center of the galaxy faster than they should be able to, given the the mass that is contained in stars in that. And so both of those things indicate that there needs to be some form of unidentified matter. Uh, so that's, and a, then, that's a dark matter halo, that, that second one. We got this. Right. Yeah. The dark matter, as far as we can tell, is smoothly distributed or effectively smoothly distributed throughout the galaxy. So at the location of the sun um, in our own galaxy, it's about the, where the composition is basically 50-50. So at the center of the galaxy, the dark matter is more highly concentrated. Um, well, so the center of the galaxy, the dark matter is more concentrated. However, the stars are even more concentrated. Yeah. Um, and so the, the relative abundance of stellar matter, like regular matter and dark matter, favors regular matter in the center of the galaxy. And then as you move outwards, the dark matter um, stays, uh, has, still has a high relative abundance, or still has a high abundance, and the stellar matter falls yeah, off. so it falls off less quickly than the, uh, than right. the uh, stellar matter. And so at the location of the sun, it's basically 50-50. The density of dark matter and the density of regular matter is about the same, which is, I believe, something on the order of a proton per cubic meter. Um, and then as you go, so once you get past the location of the sun in the galaxy, then you're dominated by dark matter. And the dark matter per halo persists yep. well beyond the stars in the galaxy. So, so the size of the Milky Way galaxy is about 50,000 light years from the center to the edge. And the, um, the dark matter halo goes two and a half, three times farther out. In fact, it's wow. probably, so you're looking at about, maybe it's even farther than that because you're looking at about um a million light years so what is it what does that make is that 20 times Fifty thousand times 20 is a million yes. um so it's about 20 times the distance um to, towards the edge of the dark matter it's plausible it's on the edge of possible that the milky way's dark matter halo and the andromeda dark matter halo have touched wow um not necessarily merge but you know the edges are are in contact with each other um, so that was the discovery of dark matter. Uh, there, there's other, there's other evidence for dark matter uh, that you get from the growth of structure in the universe. Um, but that's uh, something that came out primarily with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and other surveys that are able to look at distant galaxies that wasn't available to people in the 30s and 40s. I remember in when I was studying particle physics, it was always, what the hell is this thing? Oh. It must be the lowest mass supersymmetric particle or right. something like this stable. And it was like, but we haven't found any of those particles at the LHC. So what is it now? It's right. still the same thing. It's still, right? yeah. Uh, because so supersymmetry is the gift that keeps on giving. It's the, what, what, um, did, what, did my, uh, what did my professor call it? He called it the theorist pension plan. Just right. it's like a hydra. <laughs> you just chop one head off and then they tweak it and then it comes back again. It's uh, Yeah, it's that's... That's definitely the case. So dark energy, what what we what, what's the deal there? So we've got our five percent baryonic matter, which we kind of have a decent handle on. We've got twenty seven percent of the universe, which is this dark matter, which we're not really sure what the hell it is. And then we've still got sixty eight percent, so about two thirds, which is this dark energy. So why why is that important? Why do we why do we care? Um so we care because it's there. That's the most abundant stuff in the universe is dark energy. Uh, it's new. So I remember when the discovery of dark energy was announced and I thought that I was like, oh, these people are full of crap. Doesn't everybody know that there's no such thing as uh, the cosmological constant? Because that's what it was. I was going to say, because it, it has a little bit of a history. I think didn't Einstein describe it as his biggest mistake, which is quite right. He, he did. And so I'm, I was I could probably walk to within 10 meters of where I was sitting at the time when I heard the announcement, because I was in my car uh, getting ready for my physics class. <laughs> and I, they made the announcement. And I was like, oh, these people, they don't know what they're talking about. We already know, everybody knows that there's no such thing as the cosmological constant. Because it, when it was discovered, they called it the cosmological constant because that was the thing. The, the phrase dark energy came out later. So, um, so maybe for the people, why, why did they suggest that this dark energy, this cosmological constant, when I can speak, existed? Why? What was the finding that... So the... 
what they discovered with the these two supernova teams, they were looking at distant supernova where they can use the properties of the explosions to determine the distance to those objects. Uh, and then once you get the distance to those objects, then you can basically say, you, you can get a handle on how the universe has expanded in the past. Uh, the main thing is, uh, so uh, briefly on the discovery method, if you have a light bulb, the intensity of the light from that light bulb falls off as the square of the distance. Uh, and that's basically because energy has to be conserved. So if it's expanding in a spherically symmetric way, then the surface area of a sphere goes as R squared. And so the intensity is the energy per, or it's like the intensity is the power per square meter. And so if the square meters are getting bigger, then the power is falling off as yep. one over the area. Makes sense, yeah. Um, which is interesting, uh, just a quick thing. Uh, this is the reason why tsunamis are so much more dangerous than, uh, they're more dangerous than they ought to be because tsunamis don't expand in three dimensions. They only expand in two dimensions. Hmm. And so the energy in the tsunami falls off as one over R yeah. instead of one over R squared. And so they, the energy in the tsunami, because it's traveling on a two-dimensional surface, propagates for a much larger distance than, than a sound wave or something like that that expands in all three directions. So anyway, so the intensity of, uh, of light from a candle or from a light bulb will spread out, or the power will spread out, which means the intensity will fall as you get farther and farther away. Uh, if the universe is changing size, like going through weird kind of oscillations or something like that, then what will happen is light at a certain distance will have spread out and then it will have come back together again and then maybe spread out again and then maybe come back together again. So you have some weird expansion history of the universe, then light at different distances will have gone through different stages of expansion and contraction, which means that the brightness that you observe or the intensity that you observe uh, for these different objects will change based upon how far away they are uh, in a way that isn't just the way a candle or like a light bulb works on yeah. the earth. So they were doing that. They were saying, we have the ability to standardize the total amount of energy coming off of these explosions at different distances. And so we can measure their brightness as a function of time or as a function of distance and recreate the expansion or contraction history of the universe. And when they did that, they found that the universe is accelerating like the size of the universe is accelerating. It's getting bigger and it's getting bigger faster every day. Uh, and that was an important discovery because at the time, one of the major uh, conundrums in astronomy was the fact that the universe was younger than the stars that it contained. The oldest stars in the galaxy were like 12 billion years, uh, stars in globular clusters and things like that uh, were 12 billion years old. And the universe itself, if you just look at um, the Hubble constant today, and which is the current expansion of the universe, and everything that had been known up to that point, you only got a universe that was like 10 billion years old. And so the stars were 2 billion years older than the universe that they were hmm. presumably spawned from. And so the uh, change in... Um, so this change that the universe is accelerating, if the universe is accelerating, it means that it was going slower in the past. And because it's going slower in the past, it means that it takes longer to get to a given size and therefore the universe is older. It's just like um, when, you drive, when I drive places, even though the distance that I drive in my neighborhood is significantly smaller than the distance that I drive on the freeway, yeah. the amount of time that I spend getting out of my neighborhood is comparable to the amount of time that I spend driving on the freeway because yeah. I'm moving slower. Yeah. And so the same thing applies here, that the universe in the past was move, was expanding more slowly, um, and therefore it takes longer to get to the stage where it is today. Initially, before that acceleration was, was found, or even after that acceleration, that people expected that the gravity of those galaxies would pull together and slow down the expansion of the universe, maybe make it crunch back together. And uh, when you discover that it's actually <clears throat> accelerating, that suggests that there's... There's something that's going against gravity. That's something that's going in the opposite direction. Which right, there's some energy the that's pushing things apart. Mm. Um, it's an energy with a negative pressure. So, mm. which is um, then this dark energy, right? That then pushes things apart instead of pulling it together. So, what is the best theory at the moment about what this dark energy is? So, so you talked about this this vacuum pressure or this negative pressure. So, what what are we talking about there? Um, so we don't know, we don't know what it is. Uh, there are a variety of options. Um, there are, 
there are no good options. That's part of the problem. The issue that you face with dark energy is that if you want it, the simplest thing you can do is to make a scalar field. So you say, oh, there's a scalar field and that's the dark energy. Congratulations. This is, this is why it's attractive with the, with the Higgs, right? With right. The Higgs and so the, with the same thing with the Higgs, it's a scalar field. So that's the Higgs is the first scalar field that was ever discovered. Um, the, but dark matter is also a scalar field. Well, like it's most commonly viewed as a scalar field, at least when dark matter is. It's like, oh, you have a scalar field. And then because it's the simplest change you can make to the standard model. Um, and without, so it without takes it wanting to interact with everything that comes that comes along. Right. Yeah. So it's the least amount of work with the most amount of reward. Yeah. Like I have a dark yeah. matter model and, yeah. and there you go. Yeah. Um, so scalar fields are invoked all the time. If you want the scalar field to be to affect things at the scale of the gravitational force, then it turns out that it couples very strong. It couples the same way that gravitational forces couple uh, in that um, or a couple for the for the case of dark energy and dark matter. You need a gravitational strength coupling to the scalar field in order to reproduce the results that you see. And so the gravitational experiments, the torsion pendulum experiments, <coughs> um, you can, uh, they, if there is a scalar field, it should show up in these experiments. So if you take the, the dark energy density um, that was measured from these supernova experiments, it gives you the mass that you would need for a scalar field to be the dark energy. So if dark energy is a scalar field, then its mass would be some size. And then because the mass is some size, the force that you get from that interacts over a distance that's the exponential decay of that size, right? It's the, um, the more massive the particle is, the shorter the force, the so shorter like the range of the force, Yukawa, and the less mass of the particle. Yukawa length or whatever they call yeah, it. Yeah, so it's a Yukawa potential. And so, um, with the dark, with the discovery of dark energy, there's an energy scale associated with it that's in the milli EV scale, and the milli EV scale corresponds to millimeters when you're talking about the length scale over which it would interact. So you have like a Yukawa potential, and it would interact over a length scale of a few millimeters. And so there was uh, very quickly after the discovery of dark energy, there was an experiment called the Etwash experiment. Well, it's the Etwash group, and they do a bunch of laboratory tests of gravity uh, at the University of Washington. The idea was that they had these two disks and they would cut holes in the disk. And um, so there's a, an upper disk that it can swing, um, that's suspended by a torsion fiber or by a fiber and then it can twist. Uh, and then the lower disk is actually two disks. So there's a, a total of three disks. The lower disk is two disks with different thicknesses and they drilled holes in it. And then they would offset the two disks from each other uh, so that when the pendulum would twist, then what they would do is they would rotate the bottom ones and the holes in the upper disc, like in the torsion pendulum disc, as the turntable went underneath it, it would get attracted to the, to the place where there was material relative to where the holes were located. So the holes were kind of like negative mass, um, yeah. but they would be attracted towards the gaps between the holes. And so that would start the pendulum swinging back and forth as the mass rotated underneath it. The holes in the lower disc were specifically chosen so that so that the upper disc and lower disc, the two the holes that were drilled were offset from each other, and the thicknesses of the disc were chosen specifically so that the two effects would cancel, so that the holes in the upper disc would be evenly matched by um, the extra mass because of the extra thickness of the lower disc, mm -hmm. given the fact that it's farther away and therefore gravity falls off. Um, at a diff you know, falls off as one over R squared, or the potential falls off as one over R. So it was designed to cancel out the effects of these holes in the upper disc from the turntable. So then the idea is if there's a new force that couples over a given length scale, then it doesn't cancel. The top layer would, um, would interact with that force, but the bottom layer is too far away, and so it doesn't contribute that force. Mm -hmm. So if there's an extra force, then it would show up because of the interaction with of the torsion pendulum with the top layer that's not canceled by the bottom layer. Um, and so they were able to probe down to millimeter scales and then they've gone uh, since that time about a factor of 10 further. Uh, and they demonstrated that there's no new force that couples at gravitational strength down at the mm -hmm. scale of dark energy. And so yeah. that presents a major problem because it tells you that the dark energy is not a scalar field. It's not a generic scalar field. 
So if you want the dark energy to be a scalar field, which many theorists, well, I mean, that, that's what you have to work with when you're a theorist, um, then you have to come up with a way of hiding the, the force or screening it so that it doesn't interact in laboratory environments, but it does interact in cosmological environments. So it's, so it's almost like gravity, uh, I've heard it described in, in this way sometimes, that gravity potentially becomes repulsive at very large distances, or there's, right. an, or there's another term in gravity that we don't understand on mm-hmm. those very large distances, and maybe Einstein didn't, didn't have the full theory set out. Right, and so that's, uh, that's a way that it's often invoked. I think the particle physicists would probably not call it gravity, we don't. Um, we, we never. We never say that word. That's, right. That's that's so, the thing that's locked in the tower and just sort of never discussed. Well, so to a particle to, to a particle physicist, they would say there's a new gravitational strength force, and it's probably mediated by some quantum particle. Mm, sure. And that particle has a name, and so and that would be this scalar field thing. Is that's the particle that mediates this repulsive yeah. force, and, and they wouldn't necessarily call it gravity um, because it's not in the gravity theory. It's not the graviton. Um, now, that's not entirely true because there are some theories where the graviton is actually there. Are, there's a, a scalar, a vector, and a tensor um, particle, and the tensor part gives you gravity, and the scalar part could give you dark energy. So that's Tevis. Um, Tevis, I think, t- tensor vector scalar. Yeah, um, the Tevis theory uh, has the graviton has these partners that have uh, different spin properties. Um, and therefore you can get Einstein's gravity with one part of that. And then you get a scalar part that would give you the dark energy. Um, and that's kind of a unified gravitational theory. Um, now I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm a little bit rusty on, on these things, but as my memory serves me, that's the case. But Uh, so there are some, there are some theories of gravity that are quantum theories of gravity that contain a particle that could be the dark energy, but not all of them do. In fact, most of them don't. But the interesting thing about this DAISY study is that because they're going to such um, large distances uh, far back in the evolution of the universe, if you can see that gravity behaves differently as a function of time, maybe that can give us some insights into potentially where the bug in our theory is, if there is one. Um, So I'm going to say yes, but there's a, a big asterisk by it in that what you probe with um, astronomical observations is wildly different than what you probe in laboratory experiments. Hmm. So laboratory experiments, you need a quantum theory to, to interpret laboratory experiments, um, where with dark energy measurements that you make on the sky, and that's the only place that dark energy has been seen is with astronomical measurements. Um, then you're looking at things that are happening over gigantic length scales, um, like intercluster length scales. And so what you can constrain is somewhat limited. Yeah. The parameter space that most of these things are designed to constrain are um, the equation of state of the dark energy. So what that means is as the dark energy changes, um, as the universe changes in size, how does the energy density of the, from dark energy change? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, if, you, if you have a gas of photons, and it's at some temperature, if you expand it, if you take those photons and you expand them, the energy density of the photon gas falls as uh, the radius to the fourth power. The reason being is that you have these photons, you spread them out, and so that gives you, so you're spreading out into a larger volume, and that's three factors of R. And then also the photons themselves are stretching, which means that they're losing energy, and that's a fourth factor of R. And so how the energy density of the dark energy changes as the universe goes through its evolution is uh, what they're looking for. And what they've, they've already measured that it appears as though the equation of state is minus one, meaning that the exponent in some formula is negative one. Um, but what they want to see is if that particular exponent changes with time. Yeah. And so they're looking at the time derivative of the equation of state parameter for dark energy. So it would be nice if that vacuum pressure was much, much earlier in the early universe and then has sort of fallen off as we as we move to the Well, it could fall off, it could grow. Um, dark energy hasn't, um, hasn't really been the major contributor for uh, 
through most of redshift space. So it's only near redshift zero, um, you know, redshift one, redshift two, mm. where the dark energy has become the dominant force in the universe, causing things to expand. Okay. Now that's a lot of time, a lot of physical time. Yeah. But in terms of redshift space, um, in terms of the number of decades of time, like the orders of magnitude in yeah. time, yeah. Um, it's a small chunk. Yeah. Like a redshift of two, when you're looking at the it might not be a lot of interesting time because it's been quite uniform over that. Right. Yeah. So the um, uh, like the cosmic microwave background radiation happened at a redshift of 1100. And the Big Bang nucleosynthesis happened at a redshift uh, a lot smaller than that. Yeah. And so um, these the fact that the last two redshifts correspond to a lot of physical years doesn't mean that they're you know, yep. a lot of that has just been quiescent evolution yeah, of yeah, galaxies. Yeah. I say quiescent with like gigantic explosions of. Yeah, no, numbers. sure, but yeah, on a on a on an average out scale has been quite sort of business as usual, if you if you want to put uh, it that way. So for for most of the evolution of the universe, dark energy has not been um, the major component. Yeah. Uh, so and therefore, if you want to probe its effects, you have to have good and highly sensitive um, measurements. I think that with dark energy, with this daisy, I don't know what redshift they're going to, um, but I suspect that it's probably not much farther than uh, like three or something like that. It says it said in the article, um, there've been similar projects which we've discussed. This is going to cover much more of the sky and measures acceleration of the universe with three times the accuracy. I guess that's measuring all of the values with three times the accuracy. It's not actually going back. It's not, it's not going back three times farther. Yeah, it's not and the reason how, is how far you it's going want, Most of these measurements you want to make at the time when the transition happens between mm. dark matter or matter dominated and energy dominated. Yeah. Um, and so that there is a special point in redshift space where I think you have the most leverage. Um, so, uh, and the whole goal is to shrink the uncertainties in the equation of state parameter and its time derivative. Yeah. That's this instrument. That's what it's designed to do. It will do it by measuring the clustering properties of galaxies as a function of redshift. Yeah, it will have higher quality redshift than the photometric survey does because it can actually measure the redshift directly from the spectrum. Um, and so, you, uh, because it has the better measurements of redshift, it can place the galaxy when it has a map of where the galaxies are located. It can place them better along the line of sight. Yeah, um, thirty-five. So thir it, thirty-five million galaxies. So we're going up a. Uh, Another order of magnitude, I guess, on the yeah on the previous uh, so that, previous that's big. What what's the what's the the best result we could we could hope for out of this? Some what's the, the best, best lead be, that they could give us to, towards the, the, potentially understanding what this dark energy is? The best thing would be to see something weird. Yeah. Um, so the best thing that they would be able to to do would be either to show that the equation of state is not negative one. Um, so if you have a cosmological constant, then the equation of state is negative one. Um, so you either if they show that it's not negative one, so their error bar shrinks down to the point where the measurement is offset from negative one to some number of significant digits, um, or that the time derivative is non-zero. So one of those two things would be that, I mean, that's the kind of information. The, the time derivative of this vacuum zero. energy density. Right. Yeah. Or it's the time derivative of the equation of state parameter. Yeah. So the, it might be minus one now, but it may be in the past it was a different number, yeah. minus one point yeah. one or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so either of those two things would be an enormous breakthrough. Um, of course, no one would believe it the first time around, and so sure. then they would build another experiment to, that would look at a different part of the sky or that would, you know, probe it in some other way. Um, what they would probably have to go to a different type of probe. Um, so each, it would still be an astronomical survey uh, to probe it because that's the only way that we can do this. But they would use a different um, property of the universe to infer the dark energy properties. So for example, this one is going to be using... I mean, I'm that's, that's of, good practice, right? Because you have essentially independent verification. So the, the problem, for example, at the LHC, when we found the Higgs, you... Uh, Atlas and the CMS experiment are mm -hmm. built on completely different concepts. They have a different um, a different structure. They have different internal design, so that you get that essentially independent verification. 
the collaborations don't talk to one another regarding the results until they're published. So mm -hmm. it's good to have those different ways of approaching the same problem so you have some uh, some confidence that you, you've seen the same thing from different angles. Yeah, and the same thing happened at Fermilab. They would have uh, D0 and CMS. Or, uh, wait, CDF. CMS. Is it CDF? CDF. Yeah, D yeah CDF. The something detector facility. Um, I forget. So I forget all of my zero. acronyms now, yeah. We're built around different um, different technologies mm. looking at different tracks. Mm.